So during the pandemic, not that we're completely out of it, but during that time of the pandemic where we all stayed home for two years, give or take, and all of us found the end of the internet uh, through our time what we, with a term that was deemed doom scrolling, where you just scrolled and scrolled and scrolled. In my house, we watched three shows over and over again. I don't know why we have all of these separate subscriptions when we could just purchase these three shows and save ourselves a lot of money. But during the, our time at home, during the pandemic, we watched The West Wing from beginning to end over and over again. Ted Lasso, which has become really helpful during the World Cup because I know nothing about soccer. Everything I learned about, everything I know about soccer, I learned from Apple Plus. And then there is The Office. And I was devastated when The Office was taken off of Netflix and I had to then get another subscription service so that I could watch it. And in reflecting back on our time at home and streaming television shows, the office kept popping over and over in my mind. And then I read our scripture reading for this week, and there's a catchphrase from the office said by one Michael Scott that may or may not be appropriate used in that context of the office, but I think it might fit with our scripture reading this morning. St. Luke's account of the first Advent and Christmas is well known throughout the church. Kids who can't read, who have read the Bible over and over again, know the story. It's a story that has been read, sung, and talked about for generations. And this story begins last week, with last week's scripture lesson, with Zechariah and Elizabeth finding out that they will welcome a son into the world who is going to prepare the way for the Son of Man. And St. Luke's account culminates with the birth of Jesus and shepherds watching their flocks by night. And I would venture to say that if 1 Corinthians 13 is the preferred reading for weddings, and probably more appropriate for funerals, but that's a sermon for another day. Then Luke 1 and Luke 2 are the preferred readings for Advent and Christmas. And if these readings are good enough for Linus and Charles Schultz, then they must be good enough for us. And right now we find ourselves in the second act of this story. Mary is engaged to Joseph, and then she is greeted by the angel Gabriel, who says, Greetings! favored one. The Lord is with you. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. The kids know the story. You know the story. This child will be called the son of most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. That's right. It's that David, the David and Goliath. And this Messiah, he will reign over the house of Jacob and his kingdom will have no end. God enters our lives in the most spectacular ways, disrupting our ordinary routines in the best possible way. Pastor Susan Robb, the author of Angels of Christmas, Hearing God's Voice in Advent, notes that in last week's gospel reading, the angel Gabriel visited Zechariah, quote, in the midst of his work, in the day-to-day -day routine of his priestly responsibilities, although in the most spectacular and holy of places. And in our lesson today, Mary is no different. Catholic tradition suggests that Mary is drawing water from a well when the angel Gabriel greets her in the middle of her daily routine. And that's when the divine disruptor goes to work. Gabriel tells Mary that through her, the Savior of the world will begin his reconciling and healing work. And what was Mary's response? She said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your will. Let it be. That's what she said. 
Last Sunday, Pastor Sarah suggested that pastors tend to talk more than they should. She said, quote, pastors talk a lot. And then she turned. She grabbed the front of the pulpit so she wouldn't fall off and looked at me. And if I know Pastor Sarah as well as I know Pastor Sarah, she did the same thing to Pastor Jeff in the way. But what you need to know is that Pastor Sarah's not wrong. I host a podcast, and the show's premise is to talk about faith without using stained glass language. You all pay me to talk and to teach week after week. It's a large part of what I get to do as your pastor. And you need to know that before most church meetings that I attend with Pastor Sarah or Pastor Jeff, I will send both of them a text message saying, I will do my best not to talk more than I should during this meeting. And if you've ever been in a church council meeting, you know, well, I'll let you decide if I talk too much. Mary doesn't have many lines of dialogue in our gospel. Mary is front and center, though, in this morning's lesson. She has the lead role during Advent. And at Christmas, she transitions to the lead supporting actor. During Jesus' ministry, she's quoted once in the Gospels, in the Gospel of John, at the wedding of Cana, noticing that the party they were at, the reception for this wedding, was in trouble. She says, quote, they have no more wine. Then, as Jesus is preparing to take his last breath, last breaths, Mary's presence is noted where she is standing at the base of the cross. Her words to her son on the cross are not recorded by our gospel writers, but Jesus says to her, woman, here is your son, gesturing to John. Our Gospels, our New Testament, the entirety of the Christian Bible is written by men using male voices. It was written by men, primarily for men. That's the context we have to keep in our minds every time we turn to our Holy Scriptures. It was noted this past Wednesday night during our Wednesday night Advent study that a not-so-good byproduct of the Protestant Reformation is that we, Protestants, fail to give Mary the airtime that she deserves, fail to notice Mary and what she does throughout the entire church year. We restrict Mary to this week, or if we're going to read the Magnificat, or if we're going to sing a song, Mary, did you know? So yes, pastors, yes, we talk a lot. And I'll add to Pastor Sarah's point, and say that male pastors tend to be guiltier than others. And if it were not for women, we would not have the good news that the tomb was empty on Easter. Remember, it was Mary and Mary who went to the tomb first and ran back to the male disciples who were hiding. Female pastors, preachers, and teachers are indispensable to the church. I was thinking about what Pastor Sarah said last week as I was reflecting on our gospel lesson this morning, and I decided to look to pastors and theologians who are not male. Pastors like Susan Robb, who I mentioned a moment ago, and the Beyonce of the Episcopal Church, Reverend Fleming Rutledge. Because if we are to heed the words of Holy Scriptures, then there are times when people like me, people who are privileged within the empire, we need to listen. Let it be with me according to your word. Let it be. Those are the words spoken by Mary to Gabriel. Gabriel says, Mary, the inbreaking of the kingdom of God is at hand, and through you the Savior of the world will take center sage. Mary, through you God's grand story of salvation will take shape. Mary's response, let it be. That's what she said. Let it be with me according to the will of God, according to the grand plans of God's earth-shaking and breaking. Let it be in according to the creator of heaven and earth, the one who organized and created out of chaos. That is what Mary said. 
Reverend Fleming Rutledge notes that at the first advent, God, through Mary, not through men, is moving towards us. Reverend Rutledge wrote that Mary's response is not about human hopes and human wishes and human dreams, but it is about God. What is happening at Christmas is not of humanity, but of God. The salvific work of God is not dependent on humanity, not dependent on us for its completion. What happened at the first advent? What happened at Christmas and what will happen at the second coming, the second advent of God, is just that, of God. Reverend Rutledge wrote, The grace and mercy of God do not depend on human virtue for its fulfillment. The mystery of Advent lies precisely in its location, as it is between the now of human failure and the disappointment and the not yet of God's coming kingdom. With Mary's response, let it be, she joins the ranks of the who's who of the Hebrew Bible. Jacob, in Genesis, when he is approached by an angel in a dream and is told that he needs to go to Egypt. Moses, in Exodus, when he is called by God through a burning bush. The prophet Samuel was called by God while lying down on the ground in front of the altar in the temple. And then there's the prophet Isaiah, who was called and sent and responded with, Here I am, Lord. If you've been reading the story from Genesis, beginning at Genesis 1, and then you get to Luke 1, and you find Mary saying, let it be, you might scratch your head and wonder, what happened to the shift with the central focus of God, primarily, formerly, using men to accomplish God's will? But when we stop and we listen to what Mary said, we find that Finding favor with God has nothing to do with the favor that we find in society. God's favor upon Mary, God's presence with Mary through Gabriel and in her womb is a gift from God. Mary is favored not because of her status in society, but because God is with her. In the same way, you are favored today because, not because of what you've done or left undone. You are favored because of the faithfulness of God. With three words, let it be, Mary reveals to the world that the way things are is not how things will be when the will of God is followed and when the kingdom of God is fully realized. Let it be. That's what she said. And Mary's response, it's not that God went to work. Rather, Mary became part of what God was already doing. And the same is true for us. During this season of Advent, God is not waiting for humanity to begin God's work. Each of us, during Advent and in the ordinary times of our lives, is invited, just as Mary and Elizabeth were to be part of the story being told by God. The story that says you are not who your sins say you are, that you are beloved. You are favored. So let it be. Amen.